Welcome. Uh, it's especially gratifying to see so many people here on what may be, in fact, the last sunny day before winter sets in. So thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Joshua Cole. I'm the director of the Center for European Studies. And we have uh, a speaker today um, who I'm very pleased uh, to introduce to you. The, uh, the question of Europe and its periphery is, of course, I don't need to tell most of you here this, a, a historically contentious question, mostly because it forces us to ask, what is Europe? And where does it start? And where does it end? Um, the, our speaker today is um, going to shed some light on this question, which is, of course, very timely. Um, uh, the question of the, Euro, the Eurozone crisis has posed in very uh, in a very harsh light, uh, the relationship between the power centers in Europe and countries that are seen to be on its periphery. Um, uh, our speaker today will give us uh, what I hope is a, uh, an illumination on the historical background to this relationship. Um, his name is Sakis Gekas. He is currently a professor of history um, at York University in Toronto. He received his PhD at the University of Essex, and he has, for uh, a, a, a young professor, a very impressive list of articles and book chapters already in publication, which you can see on his website. Um, the talk today, um, which is uh, uh, related to a special issue of a journal um, that is forthcoming soon. Um, the, t the title of his talk today is The Colonial Mediterranean and Its Place in European History. Please join me in welcoming Sakis Gekas. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you all for being here, and especially the Center for European Studies uh, for the hospitality and the University of Michigan. It's a delight uh, to be here. I will uh, try to live up to the expectations as uh, outlined uh, by uh, Joseph. I'm not sure I'm going to succeed, uh, but it will be uh, determined later on. Uh, for many, in many ways, the importance of uh, the Mediterranean for European history is quite obvious, uh, but it's still not as uh, acknowledged, I think, as it should be. Definitely the importance of Greece in the Mediterranean, and especially in European uh, Mediterranean, is uh, still uh, very, it's becoming very, very uh, clear nowadays, especially since 2010. And in, um, in, a w in many ways, the, the talk uh, today was going to change uh, slightly, but I decided not to. I mean, I was talking to a friend last night, and he said, so you're going to talk about uh, Greece as a colony in the European Union? I told him, no, I'm not going to talk about the crisis. Okay, it's a uh, it's very different uh, topic. There is... Uh, However, very difficult, uh, it's, it's very difficult to disengage from recent and ongoing political events that have drawn uh, our attention to the power of neocolonialism as an idea. And it's very visible in popular understandings of who is to blame uh, for the crisis in Greece as well as in other places. I'm not so sure the same discourse has been generated in, in Spain or Portugal, for instance, but it's very prominent in uh, Greece. Only two days ago, a former minister of finance uh, mentioned that she cannot remember a country in such conditions of economic colonialism as Greece is right now, despite the 30 years of experience in the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development that she has as a development economist. There is hardly a doubt that Europe is facing a crisis that is proving the most severe in the post-war period. Long are the days of celebration, 1989 uh, and uh, 1991. Concern, 1990s, because of the uh, monetary uh, integration crisis. Affluence and complacency in the years uh, of the 2000. Without uh, being able, of course, to provide a solution to that, I think it's an opportunity for us to think about where, as uh, Joe said at the beginning, where the borders of Europe lie, what, what are the... Um, countries that are included in uh, Europe. And of course, Europe is, uh, above all, a set of uh, values, ideas, and political arguments as well. So it's not just borders as they are defined. And of course, borders have been subject to change uh, as well. 
So, the recent political events and ongoing crisis should not distract us from the history of the colonial presence in the Mediterranean because there is a, a danger of uh, sort of moving on uh, with the time, so to speak. The Arab Spring, uh, for instance, gave this idea very often that this was the end of the post-colonial period among Arab states, you know, that the former dictators that came out of uh, revolutionary nationalist uh, Arab, pan-Arab movements in the 50s and 60s, finally they were toppled down and the countries were able to move into sort of new uh, brave new world of democracy it's it remains to be seen so this is not uh, the time for us to, to not to think about the history of the mediterranean as a colonized region but instead to do otherwise respectively to think about the european past uh, of uh, the colonial past of of europe on the other hand in the last two decades or so uh, there has been a, a huge volume or rather big volume of writing an increasing volume of writing in global history that has come to supplement and contest and go beyond the industry of older so-called area studies. Basically the field that put Mediterranean in the, in the academic uh, map after the 50s. And it forces historical study to reorient beyond the ethnocentric focuses of the so-called uh, extra-European uh, history. Now, this movement came largely in response to the political, economic, and social impacts of globalization, until recently a very good thing, less uh, so now, as well as uh, em emergent academic and even activist critiques of such processes of globalizing of the globalizing world. The growth and field of diasporas creating alternative units of transnational analysis has also been very keen in the integration of Mediterranean into, uh, a scholarly, uh, into scholarly debates. Transnational research has since the 80s and 90s especially, has since grown rapidly, opening up spaces between histories of globalization and other micro-histories of regions, or histories of micro-regions, if you read uh, Holden and Parcel. Now, this uh, has been especially uh, prominent with uh, themes such as the flows of people or information across constructed and often co quite restrictive boundaries. And therefore, the study of diasporas, communities, uh, commodities and consumption and the circulation of ideas are some of the fields in which the Mediterranean has kind of emerged as a, a field uh, of study. So global histories emerged, and especially global economic histories, uh, have emerged in the early post-Cold War period and these histories tended to flatten uh, the political and social uh, complexities of the global south, so to speak. So there's a danger of uh, putting the, in these global economic histories parts of the world that are uh, formerly colonized into some sort of comparison between uh, very unequal uh, parts. And I think that's a methodological problem. So, for example, uh, global history seemed to often to take colonialism for granted. And there's, there are several cases that actually do that. They say, for instance, it's not so much a problem of colonial power relations as a problem of accessibility and distance from markets, um, factor endowments, if you're an economist, and so on. So, especially global economic history, when they're interested much more in divergent economic regions, and the divergence being particularly great when considering the gap in incomes in standards of living and production capabilities bet between Europe and Asia, if you read Ken Pomeranz, or rather between England and China, that's what he talks about, more specifically between Yangtze Delta and Yorkshire, but the argument is broad for uh, interpretation. So, and more recently about between Europe and India. So these debates are not great be for the Mediterranean, I think, because in the standard narrative and argument, the region kind of fell behind sometime in the late Middle Ages, after European he hegemony, uh, according to Janet Abulgaud, came, and the centers of European trade and economy moved further north and northwest to Amsterdam, Antwerp, and finally London. And global histories of this kind have, of course, winners and losers. And if you read that, for the sort of late medieval, early modern age, uh, the Mediterranean is kind of falling behind. Or it is integrated within itself, if you read the other kind of uh, histories of diasporas and communities that I mentioned earlier. So without arguing that nations are kind of losing their historiographical importance, far from that, or their political clout even so, and their ability to inspire aggressive nationalism, as we have seen and we're still seeing, uh, it is more fair to say that tra nations are, in the, are embedded in the term transnational, so, but they are not to be transcended, for sure. 
but instead they should be explored and debated with more diverse and combined methodologies than ever before. And I think the history of colonialism in the Mediterranean offers us the opportunity to do exactly that, as I'm going to try and show in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Historians of early modern Mediterranean have been much more successful and convincing about the place of Mediterranean in European history. Histories of empire give way to histories of men and increasingly women too, more recently. Uh, histories of conversion, language, culture, and of course the favorite of historians of the Mediterranean, trade. The empire that proved intractable to European imperial ambitions was the Ottoman Empire. This is a great uh, unknown until very recently. And historians used to love to attribute the falling behind of the Ottoman Empire to the lack of incentives that led to the economic dynamism of England, for instance, in the 18th century, and then to the Industrial Revolution, the great sort of mark, benchmark of um, modernization. However, since Napoleon's campaign in Egypt in 1798, 1798, the modernity clock started ticking for the region as well. And the race was on for regions that we now call the Middle East. The BBC, for example, calls the area from Morocco to Iran, the Middle East, and if the BBC calls that, who are we to argue otherwise? And of course, there is also a near obsession with the term Middle East, especially after the 9-11, that continues unabated, uh, forgetting that the term itself is a British colonial invention of the First World War, when empire builders pondered upon the carve-up of the Ottoman Empire, and then it was elevated to, elevated to a policy-making term, but no, really not before the 1945 and 1950s the heyday of area studies. More recently, the Mediterranean occupies little space in the work on empire and world history by Burbank and Cooper, essentially a textbook, but with the nuances that the quality of the two scholars offers. The authors use the two cases of uh, European encroachment, as they call it, into one-time Ottoman domains, one consistent with a pattern of creeping colonization, the other a thoroughgoing conquest. The invasion of Egypt uh, by Britain in 1882, on the excuse of insurmountable debt, was the beginning of the process that ended up colonizing Egypt, as Timothy Mitchell titled his book. But of course, colonizing Egypt was part of a broader process of colonizing the Mediterranean that started well before. Respectively, Algeria, for Burbank and Cooper, or more accur accurately, French Algeria, as they called it, Algeria was very quickly integrated as part of France uh, as a department, was a result of the French way of colonizing, very different from the British one. Not with French colonists first, but with Italians, Maltese, Spaniards, and Jews. A, quote, a newly remixed pan-Mediterranean population, according to the authors. In line with other parts of the col colonized world, the French imposed new definitions of citizenship, concepts of law according to the loyalties of the settlers that the French masters evaluated. This is a great uh, opportunity, I think, for historians to see how does the state reinvents itself in many ways through biopolitics, through projects of governmentality in areas from as diverse as Algeria, uh, Egypt, the Onian Islands much earlier in 1815 uh, as well, and Cyprus to, to a certain extent. Algeria, however, was special because its territory was considered, quote, integral to the French Republic, but only some of its people were integral to the Republic's citizenry. So you see the uh, disconnection there. And of course, always at the expense of the local Muslim majority. This is another constant in uh, North Africa and some islands of the Mediterranean as well. Overall, the Mediterranean is not an organic space that is shaped by people as much as, as, much as it is shaped by them. Europeans among others in our case. But it's the simply, in many of these accounts, a region kind of over there that colonial, colonial powers, new and old, in the case of Burbank and Cooper, European and, and Ottomans, for example, fought over. It's a kind of a prize, you know, a, a battleground. This, of course, does not prevent uh, the gaffes perpetrated by French politicians, and that is the, the uh, significance of the colonial Mediterranean for political discourse, who back in 2005 passed a controversial law promoting the positive aspect of the those aspects of the, quote, French presence in North Africa, as they called it, as a failed attempt to come to terms, as the phrase goes, with a colonial past. The article was, in fact, repealed in 2006 under fierce opposition from historians, among others, uh, especially activists. 
Now, British history, and history of the British Empire in particular, does not conform, uh, when you look to the Mediterranean, with a standard approach to the colonies. And of course, this uh, is a very broad field, but I would identify three types, you know, three approaches to the history of the British Empire. The role of private companies, chartered uh, companies specifically, from the Hudson's Bay that uh, I've come to know very well in Toronto, to the East India Company, uh, for instance, uh, also very uh, prominent, in fact, for many historians, East India Company colonized India first before the British uh, state uh, took over afterwards. The colonies of settlement, you know, the new, s the new colonies, let's say Australia uh, and Canada, and uh, plantation colonies in Jamaica, uh, in the Caribbean, and the American South. So colonies that would easily accept the history of British uh, presence to follow the parlance of the French Parliament from the Mediterranean, because there is simply really no uh, area of uh, the Mediterranean under British formal, informal colonial rule that came under these, these three categories. So where does the Mediterranean fit in recent or not so recent historiography? Well, uh, you'll see uh, a step back. In the Cambridge history of the British Empire in the 1920s, there are far more references than in the Oxford history of the British Empire, and it's four pages only, in the 1990s. That's what the Mediterranean uh, covers. Some attempts, there's more, much more in the Middle East, of course, in the, in the British Empire that I mentioned earlier. Some attempts have been successful in, in incorporating British colonialism in the Mediterranean within a global history framework, such as the book by uh, Linda Coley on captives and the in North African coast, but it's th certainly far from a popular research field. You know, historians of the British Empire are interested in other uh, parts of, of uh, the former empire. For many historians, economic among, among others, the Mediterranean was a place of transit on the way to India, specifically, as, a as en encapsulated in the collective volume by Chris Bailey and Fawaz, From the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. The story is told usually either as the story of the Suez Canal, undoubtedly important, or as a trigger for the scramble of Africa, which really started as a scramble for North Africa and the Ottoman Empire. So can one and should one avoid the dichotomies of dividing the Mediterranean into this sort of British, French, uh, and Italian to a certain extent, and the geographical and constructive to a certain extent, East, Central, and West, talking about the sea really now, and see it as a space in itself where European struggles with uh, other potential um, claimants of the sea were played out mostly at the expense of the Ottoman Empire and the North African semi-autonomous states. This is another thing I'll, I'll briefly mention later. I think, yes, uh, they should be seen as its own space where many imperial outposts and colonial possessions can be useful in understanding not just the history of the region, so a history uh, in the Mediterranean, so to speak, but the history of the British Empire as well, uh, and the history of the Mediterranean, that is, how it was constructed as a colonial space. Now, in the course of the 17th century, the character of the relationship between European states changed dramatically with important repercussions for the Mediterranean. Long-term colonization of the sea by Venetians, Ottomans, and shortly the Genovese, and much more fragmented in the Western Mediterranean and in the island of Chios and a couple of others in the Aegean. The waning of the Mediterranean, a very important book, I think, by the late Farouk Tabak, showed how to write a geohistory, as he calls it, of the Mediterranean, where the inner sea is not a timeless entity of the vine and the olive tree, as we have learned, with ecologies and features that remain the same over time and centuries, but, as Tabak demonstrated, and once the center of the research gravity changes to the history of the commercial republics, especially Venice and Genoa, it is, it is possible, and in fact necessary, to integrate the history of Western and Eastern Mediterranean with the Ottoman Empire in order to understand the fading of the Mediterranean as a center in world history. Now, for many people, uh, and um, as I said, this friend mentioned it last night, you know, Greece has become, uh, as is, is being seen, as a special kind of colony. Uh, that, under the, in the, during the recent crisis, uh, that has magnified the status of the country and its visibility, these, however, ideas are not that new. I mean, at least the scholarly uh, debates. Uh, Michael Hersfeld, uh, in many other things, as in this one, has argued first for a while now, back in 2002, in his crypto-colonialism article, that European powers allowed some nominal sovereignty to elite groups, to quote him, 
consolidate their authority using culture as its primary measure and economic coercion as its most compelling instrument. This crypto-colonial condition had, of course, a political and, in fact, constitutional dimension. To continue what Michael Herzl says, the Greek monarchy was always derided as foreign because it was widely perceived to be a key agent of the crypto-colonial process. By any definition, however, even that of the most radical approach of uh, Black Athena and the African origins of European civilization, the origins of this uh, civilization were not so much African, but well, Mediterranean, and are to be found in the Eastern Mediterranean speci specifically and its connectivity of cultures and commerce. So whether you look at Greece or the wider region of the Eastern Mediterranean, the fact is that the history of the sea, and in fact as the history of the sea during its colonial period of the 19th and early to mid 20th century, goes right at the heart of the history of European identity. The Hellenocentrism that gave both birth and in fact dominated anthropology for a very long time is the same Eurocentrism that has... Uh, dominated anthropology and elevated Herodotus as the grandfather of the discipline, but then forgot about uh, the region and castigated Byzantium to the very long dark ages in between antiquity and classical revivalism. Interestingly, the same figure, Herodotus, is considered to be the grandfather or great-grandfather of global history for many people. He is the, the first uh, person to sort of roam around the Mediterranean and write these sort of histories of connections and comparisons to his mind if you take him uh, for granted the history with the giant um, spiders, I think, that guard the mountain of gold is my favorite one, somewhere in Egypt. Now, on the other hand, of course, more alert to current developments and our polycentric world, and not under the pressure of the colonial past of anthropology, global historians have been keen to demonstrate the transfer and exchange of people, ideas and goods literally around uh, the globe, attempting sometimes to strike a balance over uh, various empires throughout history. And this is a vain uh, attempt. The colonial Mediterranean for other people has been a product of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution in many ways. And this is why uh, the, the date of 1798 is really important. This is when Europeans as a state and as a modern uh, empire engaged with parts of the Mediterranean seeking to expand their imperial clout. This is the advent of, for many people, of colonial modernity. You know, this is the time when uh, the region came into contact with Europeans who were uh, really moving into a different uh, age and uh, speed. Now, of course, this uh, example shows that, that once you start thinking along these lines, that there are conflicting or at least competing modernities, not just multiple or uh, alternative ones. The success uh, of the transport, transplant sorry, of the Napoleonic army uh, to the Egyptian uh, conditions of th authoritarian rule under Muhammad Ali, very uh, prominent in debates, has probably served the needs of an expanding regional Muslim empire, uh, a different form of state that very few people know about, the state of Muhammad Ali, which really took on many, many uh, elements from the French uh, army, uh, me medical uh, facilities and doctors, and trained uh, the Egyptian army to fight uh, in a very efficient way. It's just uh, to give you two examples, it uh, took on against the Ottoman Empire and the Sultan, not just once, but twice. And in fact, it was the British army who stopped the armies of Muhammad Ali in, uh, in Syria. Now, the Mediterranean is, as, as a border, as often uh, considered, was considered, was fixed during the 19th century and the period of national sovereignty that was asserted uh, over sea as well as land. And this is, again, if you look from the other side, not so much from the centers of European empires, but for what is happening in the sea specifically, you see the formation of new states, such as that of uh, Muhammad Ali, who, on in return for his services to the Ottoman Sultan to help him uh, crush the revolution in Greece in the 1820s, he got in return the island of Crete. And in the island of Crete, some very interesting things happened for about 10 years, between 1830s and 1840s, such as the opening of the local newspaper, state newspaper, of course, Vakagi Giridiges was called, the newspaper of Crete, which really is a new, uh, the new newspaper in, in the whole region. On the other hand, there is a difference, however, between that's, uh, that's 
one example. There's a difference between studies that deal with the Mediterranean as a space in between geographically, but also in between disciplines. And the distinction between a history of the Mediterranean and a history in the Mediterranean is thought-provoking, but the emergence of the field of Mediterranean studies and its ongoing uh, popularity, I think, is the most important set of issues that force us to rethink that its relation uh, with Europe. And for some reason, there has been more work on the ancient Mediterranean and the modern and the early modern than on the modern, because once you go into the period 1800 onwards and you delve into the modern period, the colonial and the post-colonial, there is a sort of uh, imbalance. You know, there's a disruption of uh, Mediterranean modernity into you know breaking into different points uh, in time, and it co continues until today, for instance. Now, the weight of technology, however, the ability of colonial empires to exert immensely more powerful measures, techniques, and orders, and to impose their authority and claim even moral superiority on top of that, is really what distinguishes the modern period from uh, the earlier one. I mean, the, the age of the steamship, for instance, that uh, was able to crisscross the Mediterranean to dispatch orders uh, regularly, but also to allow people to travel you know, or at an appointed time, you know, we tend to forget that, you know, ships kind of went on uh, according to sails. So you depend pretty much on wha how the wind blows. But then after the 1830s, 1840s, there's uh, a whole series of events that changes under the Austrian-Hungarian and the Lloyds of Trieste, uh, the French, uh, the uh, Messenger Mediterranean and the British um, Liverpool steamship companies, for example, that really change the geography and the topography, to use a, a local term, of the Mediterranean. The role of the state, I think, is another field that really invites us to think about what is happening in that region under colonial uh, rule. And one of the most insightful ways to understand the colonial encounter is to look at these places that are, I'm not going to use the word hybrid, but they are definitely in negotiation between uh, colonial uh, authorities and uh, local uh, people. There are limits uh, also to the development uh, capabilities of violence uh, in the Mediterranean have. Uh, I mean, how can we explain otherwise the tremendous pressure that the lack of resources places on people who are born on Malta? And especially once the traditional and successful, very successful role as pirates and corsairs in the early Medi Mediterranean uh, ended. If Johnny Depp started a film in a film called Pirates of the Mediterranean, he would probably be Maltese. And then, how can you blame them when they welcomed uh, British colonization and subsequently, however, migrated to North Africa, benefiting precisely from their status as British citizens, as British subjects? And this is part, and it is part of a pattern of people who move from the, so to speak, islands of the Mediterranean and its northern shores to North Africa. This is what happens up until the 1920s, 1930s. And now, of course, it is reversed. It's the people who move from the uh, shores of Africa to uh, the northern shores of the Mediterranean and the European Union. So Mediterranean histories of the modern period are told either in polemic and the colonial narratives, and this is why it's very uh, national uh, narrative, uh, or from a national or one imperial powers point of view, such as Mitchell colonizing Egypt, works on French colonialism in uh, Africa, in uh, North Africa and Algeria, and, to a certain extent, the work of Italian critical uh, historians to Italian colonialism. And, of course, there's uh, a very strong history, a long history of violence, an intense history of violence, both in the uh, Algerian uh, nationalist uh, revolution and decolonization, but also in the resistance of Libyans in, uh, in the uh, attempt of Italians to, to colonize. And Libya, of course, is an Italian colonial invention because there was Tripolitania and, and Cyrenaica before the autonomous Ottoman region. So there was no Libya to start with, uh, even. On the other hand, uh, there is a very interesting trend, I think, that is emerging with uh, stories that are being told from the point of view of migrants, and very topical as well for what is happening today. Uh, people uh, such as Julia Clancy Smith, for example, you know, in her book, Mediterraneans, uh, shows why migration is so important. First, because it is topical, as I said, this is what continues and it's, it's very interesting to understand the history of this uh, pattern. It forces one to study the relationship between states and subjects, and that's, that's various states in the region, and not all with their now recognized and uh, completely rationalized also in terms of biopolitics processes, such as the, the invention of the passport, for instance. The passport has its own history. Very interesting to see how it first uh, acquired 
uh, routes in the Mediterranean and developed. And it also is very apt to study ports uh, in the Mediterranean because you can identify life stories that make history more tangible and readers could relate to them. Unlike books that either enumerate imperial strategies, for instance, from the point of view of the center of the Im imperial uh, capital, or discuss uh, absent uh, abstract structures and systems of power in the Mediterranean. The study of islands, these are, uh, of course, the quintessential Mediterranean places in imagery as well as history, uh, is also another uh, interesting field. But all, of course, not all Mediterranean islands are born equal for studying colonial encounters. The Ionian Islands, for instance, stand out as the islands on the frontier between the Muslim Ottoman Empire and the Christian Venetian Empire and the Italian Peninsula. This is, again, that's not something that a historian or uh, a deconstructionist uh, literary theorist uh, argued. This is what people thought at the time. You know, that's why they're very uh, ambivalent about these people. They call them from Mediterranean Irish to uh, if they go to the, if they cross to the mainland under Ottoman rule, uh, their favorite term is, is Christian Turks. The sophistication and wealth of studies for the early modern period, of course, has not been matched, unfortunately, by specialists of the modern Mediterranean. And this is perhaps because there's this, so to speak, methodological nationalism. So people would look from their own, so to, so to speak, country point of view or formal, uh, former empire and colony and forget what was happening perhaps pretty much uh, right next to their region. What one can aspire is an approach that avoids this exactly this methodological uh, nationalism that has dominated studies of the colonial uh, Mediterranean. So, for example, French studying colonial Algeria and Tunisia, Tunisians and Algerians studying French Africa and the Maghreb, British studying the British colonies, pretty much, uh, usually elsewhere, not in the Mediterranean, and Italians studying most often Eritrea, which is a very interesting case for them, which is not even in the Mediterranean. <coughs> as well as Libya, of course, and to some extent, the Dodecanese. There are more possible combinations, Spanish studying Morocco, uh, for instance, but you get the idea. And Greeks? Well, the Greeks are far too engulfed, I think, uh, in their own country's historical trajectory, for that for a long time, and especially uh, after the, the year 1821, that they consider as the big bang of modern Greek history. The only recently, Greek historians that is, have delved into the history of the Ottoman Empire, and very few, very few of them see actually the history of their country as part of the history of empires, let alone constituting, constituting a chapter in the history of colonialism. And if you just think about the history of the state in Greece, for example, it's very interesting that we consider the beginning of the state uh, in 1830 most often, 1821, if you get like and include the period of Governor Capodistrias. But then we forget that it was different forms of Greek state in the Onian Islands in the form of the Onian Republic. So there you have an, an alternative constitutional project there in the making, not just a history of uh, a, a, a dynasty. So what place for, uh, of the colonial Mediterranean in European history? I think uh, you know, it's, it's hardly a case to be made if you look at the colonial past of uh, you major European countries, uh, Britain, France, and uh, Italy especially. But also, it's very clear that the colonization of the Mediterranean, again, 1800s, 1960s, saw the rise and fall of Europe as a global power. And in this Europe, one should include both Britain and Russia, because the ties with continental Europe, first of both, are extremely strong, and the expansion over the Mediterranean, especially, developed in competition of these two with France. So there is, you know, there is a different part of involvement of uh, of Russia in the Mediterranean that is extremely important and not often acknowledged, unless by Russian historians, most often. So bo they both went uh, into great length uh, co in competing with France, winning the Napoleonic Wars there, and trying to keep the British, that is, the Russians out of the Eastern Mediterranean, but also going to great lengths, sometimes fighting wars on behalf of the Ottoman Empire, as I said earlier, on the advance to stop the advance of Mehmet uh, Ali of Egypt. So really the support for the Greek cause of independence is an aberration, is an exception, to a standard British policy of uh, pretend preventing the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and allowing the Russians to uh, move further south. 
After the control of the Eastern Mediterranean by the British through informal uh, colonial rule and the Treaty of Baldalimani in 1838 that opened British goods to European to Ottoman markets without any uh, taxes, any duties, is uh, a usual uh, turning point. So oh, informal colonial rule, to use an old term, but not through trade this time, but armed forces and navy in particular, is very prominent. A gunboat diplomacy, as uh, we know in Greece, was very prominent uh, as well there. Britain and France became the new dominating imperial powers in the 1830s onwards in the Mediterranean. And many areas of the Mediterranean became directly or indirectly influenced by especially British rule. Just to enumerate, Malta in 1802, Sicily in 1806 until 1815, Ionian Islands in 1815 until 64, Cyprus in 1878, Egypt in 1882, and Palestine in 1920. The British showed a preference for strategically important straits and maritime routes that bypass islands, while the French established their own, so to speak, North African Empire in the Maghreb, and Italians came later to build an empire rather late, but equally violent in the case of Libya, at least. So how to do the history of colonial uh, Mediterranean? Well, the following only indicates ways to approach the history of the sea from 1800 to 1960s. Representations of the colonial sea and the discourses that shaped the images and realities for the colonized in the region, the colonial politics that established monopolies of power over regions in the Mediterranean under different forms of rule are some uh, of the examples. Colonial governments, for instance, protectorates, mandates, indirect political influence, they can be seen in the same light. I mean, they serve in a, in a, in a way uh, the same purpose, but they are being played out in completely different ways on the ground. The history of everyday life seems indispensable nowadays to any good book, and there's a uh, case for that. Illicit activities, contraband trade, migration and prostitution, galvanize historians who look at the history of Mediterranean ports and excite the general public's imagery. Together with migration, mobility in the ever-transient Mediterranean is another suitable and promising field of research. Ports, of course, are by definition the best places to look for immigrant stories and reveal the relationship between them, newcomers, existing residents, and state authorities. Proximity and diversity of these ports is very common in all accounts. And technology, as I said earlier, has again uh, played its role. The disappearance of ports as, commer as uh, commercial transit points with the lack of connection between ports and the substitution of maritime with air travel has had its toll. The only passenger boats that crisscross the Mediterranean today are cruise boats and can only protract, protract the romanticization of the Mediterranean and, 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 and an adoration of the region, of the region's ancient past. We know, for instance, that there are cruises that contain lectures that prepare travelers for the visit the next day. The sheer speed of expansion uh, to, the, to the control, uh, the ability to control, and the technological transformation of the 1800s that started again in, with Napoleon's defeat plans, they reshaped Europe, but also the Mediterranean so to speak, so civilized, as, as it was called, colonial order, aimed to promote a facade of moral instead of territorial conquest that only the British can claim to have promoted, since both French and Italians were very clear on their territorial claims to other regions, especially over the Ottoman Empire. It's a process that goes on. You know, the Ottoman-Libyan, the Ottoman-Italian uh, war, for instance, of 1911, is the war that uh, led the Dodecanese to be occupied by Italians and the south of Turkey, the uh, region of Antalya, to be held until 1921. You know, when uh, Turkish uh, colleagues and national historiography uh, in Turkey talks about the war of independence, it's not just a war of independence against the Greeks, it's a war of independence against the Italians, for instance, uh, that happened first. One of the driving forces, therefore, of, nation of European national antagonisms was the conflict in the Mediterranean. And the study of uh, colonial Mediterranean lends itself to comparisons with other colonized regions around the world. I don't think there's reason why we shouldn't do that. The field of state power, as I mentioned, and formation is in particular a unit of uh, comparison. There is also a, um, a another contemporary that is kind of now uh, 
left the, is under the radar, so to speak. There's no nobody talks about it anymore. The debate over Turkish membership in uh, in Europe that I think brings up very interesting and colonial or near colonial, or if you read uh, the uh, Turkish Foreign Minister uh, book, uh, neo Ottoman approach to uh, Turkey today over Mediterranean history. And then, of course, it relates to the countries claimed or real, asserted or uh, proven or historical uh, colonial past in the region. The, in the Cold War, the, the Mediterranean, of course, seemed uh, to fall into oblivion and transient place where the only main place uh, it, holds, it holds for Northern, especially Europe, is uh, during the summer months uh, on, and the tourist uh, season. However, Europe as a project had to move on to a different age that culminated to the Treaty of Europe and after five decades, just before the crisis of 2007, to the development of the Mediterranean project, the Barcelona process for the Mediterranean. And all that is gone now for the lack of funds, uh, obviously, but also vision. Positions are hardening, xenophobia and anti-immigrant parties are on the rise and in some countries in power. The process has been much more uh, PR rather than results, and unless the, ex the exercise aimed at securing access to the natural resources of North African sta states. There's some great photos of President Sarkozy meeting Tunisian uh, president dictators, rather, Ben Ali, and uh, the French president again meeting, uh, or the Italian president, Prime Minister Berlusconi meeting uh, Gaddafi to discuss basically the um, collaboration between the countries and uh, the North African countries' natural resources. And the, the, the great manifestation of the use of the European countries, Italy in this case, colonial past, is when um, Prime Minister Berlusconi offered his apologies and offered 2.5 billion euros, I don't know if he actually paid that, to compensate for the, the crimes of Italian colonialism in Libya. That was in 2007. So debates such as this, and especially the Turkish uh, membership in the EU, uh, draws clear lines about those who argue in favor and uh, against. Now, the argument, of course, can be a technical one, uh, the one that assesses Turkey over its progress in human rights, for instance, market economy and liberal mm -hmm. democracy, and sets aside the cultural arguments for and against Turkey's place uh, for people like President Sarkozy, who against claim that I'm not going to tell French children that the borders of Europe are, are in Syria and uh, Iran. Now, politicians, as we know, are very hard to trust. Uh, they seem to be even more dubious when considering views, uh, when we consider views such as those of Tony Blair, who argued in 98 that uh, Kosovo, whether uh, at the time uh, being in, in fighting for its independence, was on the doorstep of Europe, which would leave Greece hanging out in the yard with the other Balkans. Of course, if you take geographical definition. Of course, the Balkans assumed their own period of fame or other notoriety during the 90s and forced to the fore ideas about the inherent violence of Balkan peoples, presumably, another orientalizing distortion and lack of understanding of the region's history or other Balkanism, as Todorova uh, called it, another step in the fragmentation of uh, European uh, parts, some of it parts of the Mediterranean. So during the colonial period, the sea was uh, fragmented further and was reordered uh, and reordered existing dichotomies into rural and urban Mediterranean, regional and national, uh, colonial and nationalistic spaces. In fact, the emergence of new states, some of them dictatorial, as I mentioned earlier, ended only uh, last year or the year before with the fall of the post-colonial period or the end of the post-colonial period, during which leaders of anti-colonial struggles became uh, dictators. We often forget that the important peculiarity of the colonial Mediterranean is that from the beginning of the 19th century, France and Britain, and if you consider the Austrian-Hungarian and German influence on Italy and the Ottoman Empire, encroached southern European regions first and dominated them. In the beginning of the 19th century, both Italy and Spain were under Napoleonic rule, while Italy was not even a country, and Italians had still to be created. Northern administrators and travelers, including those from northern Italy, people from Milan, uh, Turin, for instance, described southern Italy as archaic, uncivilized, and primitive societies. In fact, they call them Africans. They use uh, the term. British travelers, respectively, officials and administrators, wrote about southeastern Europe, the Ionian Islands, and the Balkans in similar fashion. 
The romantic philalenism of the 1820s soon subsided and gave way to the phlegmatic and occasionally outrageous critique of Greeks as, uh, as I said earlier, Mediterranean Irish or Christian Turks. People were there, were there backward but promising, uh, definitely in need of pat paternalist guidance. To such an extent that elites as well as subaltern groups internalized their new identities and called themselves in petitions, for instance, to the British uh, colonial uh, administrator, they called themselves the children of the benevolent paternal uh, colonial father. The image of a static Southeastern European culture, defined by family and clan structures, for instance, that never change, absent of civil society, uh, perhaps even unable to have one, uh, in any case, resistant to change, this is what comes across, even today, or especially today, when the issue of structural reforms is being discussed, as they are called today, as modernization is called today, uh, from the period when the process still had some credibility. All perpetuated, of course, all these uh, tendencies by that very Mediterranean discipline, anthropology, and its British pra practitioners in particular, but also, in the case of Greece, very often since the 60s or 70s, especially then, political sociologists and political scientists who analyzed the European Mediterranean with categories and concepts invented and coined for the so-called third world. So it was, it was not core, for sure. It was not periphery either. Why not put it in the semi-periphery? The colonial and post-colonial heritage was present in that too. North Africa was included to the European continent through colonial discourses and practices of the French Lake, for instance, and the Italian Fourth Shore of Libya. Southern Europe was, and perhaps still is, depicted to some extent as a part of Africa in very popularized and racial uh, discourses, or the Orient. To conclude, French colonial rule abolished the reality of the sea as a barrier and moved the border, so to speak, from the sea to North Africa and the Sahara Desert. This is very clear, and not just for, again, historical reasons, but for administrative reasons as well. The British were more nuanced. If the British was a sea uh, that divides, therefore, and unites, it certainly divided different people in 1900 than it had a, a century earlier. Imperial networks of trade and migration within areas of British control, formal or informal political, and especially economic, created hybrid but unequal identities. The formation of colonial banks, for instance, and the Onion Bank is one of them, comes very early. You know, the, the same people who invest in the colonial bank, uh, Onion Bank, they invest in the Bank of Australasia, for instance. There's no difference to their mind uh, as far as opportunities for investment are concerned. You know, the sort of great mobility of uh, British capital. The description of many ports of the Mediterranean as, com as cosmopolitan, another sort of prominent field um, of prolific writers, often masks these new inequalities generated by the colonial condition. In fact, the term colonial itself, perhaps, has a particular Mediterranean meaning. Shall we use it in inverted commas to alert audiences to the complexities of Mediterranean-style colonialism? I would say perhaps not, to prevent relativism from taking its toll. But there is little doubt that in North African cities, some Europeans were more European than others. French, British, and German, but also North Italians, were more European, for instance, than Maltese, South Italians, and Greeks, who were in turn more European than the locals, especially the Arabs. Identifying the EU with Europe was never a good idea, and it's unlikely to change. All the more reasons, then, to argue for the Mediterranean past of European history, since until today, Several parts of the once colonized Mediterranean remain excluded from the canon of European history, and therefore from any geographical, economic, or cultural definitions of Europe. Studying British, French, and Italian colonialisms shows the instability of Europeanness in these lands and forces us to historicize it perhaps even much more than other former colonies, where identities were more pronounced, but of course equally uh, bias biased, such as in South Asia, for instance, or uh, the Caribbean. In 1921, a 21-year-old graduate from a peasant town in Lorraine crossed the Mediterranean for the first time to teach history and geography in Algeria. He took a ferry from Marseille to Algiers, and the experience stayed with him forever. He stayed in Algeria until 1933 and gave himself to pre pleasures of living in a magnific magnificent city, as he wrote, and enjoying beautiful women, seafood, and wine. He traveled all over North Africa and married the daughter of a landowner in the department of Oran in Algeria. 
Our hero, later in life, revealed how he discovered the Mediterranean and in fact a whole new intellectual world when he heard Henri Piran lecture there in 1931 about the closure of the Mediterranean after the Muslim conquest. He said, it was during these years, between 1927 and 1933, when I lived in the archives without having to choose my subject that my decision ripened, and so I choose the Mediterranean. In case you are wondering how can a whole lecture on Mediterranean history fail to mention the father of Mediterranean history, then wonder no more. <laughs> Our hero is, of course, Fernand Brodel. His conception of the Mediterranean was a product of the colonial condition. In close collaboration and exchange with the scholars of the French colonial school, Brodel, perhaps unintentionally back then, helped legitimize French colonial presence, wrote essays on French colonial culture, and defended French colonization against critics. Although Brodel's Mediterranean book was extremely original, this originality owed a lot to the experience of colonization in North Africa and French geopolitical concepts of the sea. It was the colonial Mediterranean that chose Brodel as a brilliant historian, but not the other way around. Thank you very much. Thank you.